It's been six months since Photoshop for the iPad was released and I thought, hey, this is a good start, but it's not there yet. So how is it now? Has it improved? Is it ready to go? Let's find out. Hello, my name is Brad. I review tech for creative professionals. In November of last year, the long-awaited Adobe Photoshop for the iPad was launched. The fall is the busy season around here with a ton of new products and software launching, and I didn't really have the time to sit down and do a proper review. And by the time that I did, everybody else on the internet had pretty much shared their opinion, and their opinion was universally kind of negative. Guys, Photoshop for iPad is here and it sucks. Straight up garbage. I was one step away from taking my iPad and frisbeeing it across the room. So hopefully your Photoshop experience will be smoother than mine. I can't say I disagree with them. The question of any review is, is the value of the product worth the price that they're charging for it? I wanted to start this video with a different question, which is why were so many people disappointed with Photoshop for the iPad? And six months later, has it improved? Has that value proposition changed? And lastly, where does Photoshop for the iPad go from here? Before I jump in, a quick note whenever I draw on a video like this, I get asked, hey, do you use a screen protector? And yes, I'm using the Paper-like screen protector here on my iPad Pro. Paper-like has been kind enough to sponsor this video. I've always found that the iPad smooth glass screen to be a little bit too smooth. I like having some texture there to give me more drawing control, cleaner lines, more stable lines. It feels so much more natural like drawing on paper. It also makes this really cool noise. There is a link for paper like down in the description. You can get one of these to fit any size iPad. Tell them I sent you. Okay, onto the video. So let's start with that first question. Why were so many people disappointed? Most apps are born because someone has a problem and they don't see any software solving that problem. Sketchable on Windows was designed to be a sketchbook for Windows touchscreens and tablets. And at the time, most of the software that existed didn't work particularly well on touchscreens. Almost all art apps start this way. Clip Studio was designed specifically for drawing comics. Procreate for digital painting on the iPad. Photoshop is no different. It started as a way to edit photos, hence the name Photoshop. But gradually, over the course of 30 years, Photoshop has become everything to everyone. They expand the type tools and designers think, hey, I can do layouts in this. They add to the brush tools and illustrators say, wow, I could do digital art in this. They expand the color correction tools and organized crime says, hey, we could counterfeit money with this. Fun fact, you can't actually counterfeit money in Photoshop. Even within photography, there are different uses. Some use it for color correction, some use it for exposure, some use it for photo manipulation, some for batch processing, some for just a combination of all of those things. And because of its age and place in the creative industry, Photoshop has just become the tool that you go to if you want to do anything. That's not a bad thing at all. In fact, a lot of people love Photoshop and use Photoshop. It's one of the most popular pieces of software in the world. The problem comes in is when you take this application, which has so many features, so much packed into it, and you port it to a brand new platform, you have to figure out what features you want to prioritize over other features. If you can't bring every single feature over on the first go, you're gonna make somebody unhappy. And I think that's where Photoshop for the iPad went wrong. By bringing over just their base features, they guaranteed that they weren't really going to make anybody happy. And even within the creative community and probably within the Photoshop development team itself, they can't even agree upon what are the basic features that you need to use Photoshop. Since I tend to look at apps from the point of view of an illustrator, I knew from the get-go that we were not going to be the core audience for this. In fact, it was pretty obvious we weren't going to be the core audience because Photoshop, or Adobe I should say, brought out an app called Fresco, which was designed specifically for digital painting on the iPad just a few weeks before Photoshop was released. It's easy to get bogged down in how this does or does not fit into the workflow that you had on the desktop. I know I fell into that pit. And over the last couple weeks, as I've tried to incorporate Photoshop for the iPad more into my workflow, I've fell into that pit quite a few times. Pulled out an image of Procreate and thought, I'm just gonna resize this and then upload it. And I couldn't resize the image on the iPad. And as I was writing this script, I made a whole list of things that I bumped into where I thought, man, I just, I just can't quite do this the way Photoshop is set up now. But then I realized 
That's not the video I wanted to make. That poor dead horse has been beaten enough. Instead, I want to take a second and focus on some of the things that I think they did right. In order to do that, we need to take a step back and look not just at this app that we have here now, but what this app is signaling about what Adobe's future is with touch interfaces. They have released several updates, about almost one a month. Now, most of these focus around bug fixes and some additional features here and there. Probably the biggest addition that we have seen feature-wise is a select subject tool, which is really a handy tool. It just kind of knows what you were hoping to select. And I found that it works really well. I really did expect it to be wonkier than it was. Earlier this year, they followed that up with the release of an object select tool, which is another auto selection tool, and also some updates more recently to how fonts are handled. And outside of a couple bug fixes, that's pretty much it. So what does that tell us about the direction they're taking it? Well, they're definitely focusing on photographers and photographers who want to do editing. The one thing I personally think Adobe is headed in the right direction with is the interface. I know not everybody agrees with that, but I have some reasons why I think they're going in the right direction with this. Between Photoshop, Fresco, and the upcoming Adobe Illustrator, it's easy to see that Adobe is trying to consolidate all of their tools into one singular interface. And I think this is a very, very good thing. Jumping between Photoshop, Adobe Animate, and After Effects on the desktop, you would have no idea that these were all created by the same company. And there's a reason for that. They weren't. Adobe acquired those applications from other companies years ago. Creating a universal interface that they can use across all of their future apps is a really smart move. Using layer features in one app is the same as using it in any other Adobe app. You want to expand your tools in one app, you could do it the same way in another app. The more features your app has, the harder it is to learn and to use. This is UI Design 101. If your app only has to play and pause music, you only need one button. If your app lets you make playlists, go back and forth through songs, favorite those songs, send them to friends, you're just gonna need more interface elements. If Adobe's plan is to make these apps as robust as their desktop counterparts, then they're going to be stuffing a lot of things into this interface. Complexity doesn't always equal bad. If they're needlessly complex, yeah, that, that's bad. But being complex because your app is more powerful and does more things, that's, that's just a fact of life. The benefit of having a universal interface is that once you learn how to add or modify text in one application, it's gonna work the same way in every other application. So you learn one interface one time, that makes the learning curve far less steep when you jump into any other Adobe application. This appears to be the direction that Adobe is heading in, but there is no such thing as the perfect interface. Everything in UX is a trade-off. When you do one thing, you're trading it off for something else. An app like Procreate can focus only on drawing and painting. Yeah, you can add text in Procreate, but it's hidden away in a menu. Yeah, you can animate in Procreate, but again, that's hidden away in a menu. Procreate's primary focus is painting, and the only tools that it puts front and center are for that, are for painting. And for that task, digital painting, it's always gonna be more streamlined than say Adobe Fresco is because Fresco is working within a predefined interface structure. Adobe is solving a different problem. Adobe is solving a system problem and Adobe Fresco is gonna be very user-friendly to people who are already using all of the other Adobe apps on the iPad. Procreate on the other hand is designed to be user-friendly for Procreate users. Everything in UX, is a trade-off. And if Adobe can carry off this long-term plan of bringing more and more of their apps onto the iPad and onto touch-based interfaces, this is going to pay off in the long-term, but in the short-term, there are going to be a lot of growing pains. And therein lies the problem that they're facing with Photoshop is one, people are learning this new interface while at the same time, not everything they expect to be in their interface is available to them. If you spend 15 or 20 minutes just trying to figure out how to import a Photoshop brush into Photoshop on the iPad, you're gonna become really frustrated when you hit that point and discover, wait, I can't even do that. 
You multiply that by all of the features that are missing in Photoshop and that little bit of a frustration turns into a very big frustration very quickly. So Adobe was in a lose-lose situation. I mean, there was no way that they could have gone out there and made everyone happy. That That's just impossible. But I also feel like a lot of the wounds they've inflicted here are really self-inflicted. They have done this to themselves because Adobe is really good at over-promising and under-delivering. Let's imagine Adobe said nothing about Photoshop until the day it dropped. But what if they had said in November, hey, this is a thing, we're releasing it in beta or even alpha today for you to check out. And they just surprised everybody with it. I think the the response to this application would have been overwhelmingly positive, even if it doesn't do all the things we expected it to do. If they had packaged it up like a bonus for Creative Cloud subscribers as a beta thing by itself, I think they would have been fine. But instead they went out there and they said, this is full Photoshop for the iPad. Full Photoshop is coming to the iPad and they announced it uh, in an interview article the same exact week that Procreate launched a really big update with a lot of new features for the iPad and Affinity Designer came almost fully featured to the iPad. It seemed more like damage control than a really good product announcement. How they presented it really set expectations extremely high and a bar that really was completely unrealistic to cross. And those are my general thoughts on Adobe Photoshop. It's such a great start. It is a foundation. If you look really hard, you can see it, but that's the problem. Y you have to look really hard. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any comments or questions, let me know in the comment section down below, and I'll talk to you in a couple of days.